You, you are right that there's, inter there's something called the International Passenger Survey. The net migration figures are calculated from that. So, and that's people who, s who say they're going to be here for a year or more, and that's counted as permanent migration. Um, but interestingly, those statistics are quite different from those that are collected via national insurance numbers. So if you then want to work in the UK, you have to get a national insurance number. And I think I'm right in saying that last year, the, the number of, of national, insurance num uh, national insurance number applications was over 600. So it's considerably more than the number of people who, who say they're coming here. And, um, but those statistics are actually quite difficult to get hold of and analyse, and there's not much kind of transparency around them. But I think that it's also the case, obviously, that some, of, some people who get national insurance numbers don't stay here. So they might just, you have to have one to work, register, you might only be here for a month just got a building job or something like that and then then you then you go back home and but of course what we then don't know is how many of those people come back come back and forward um so i think it, it is very difficult to come up with any um real number so currently you know when we're talking about how many eu citizens are currently within the uk and might be looking to gain permanent residence we we actually don't even know that that full number because we don't have a full registration system and actually, interesting, in asking, so we did have a source of data about European migrants that, that um, Charles may know more, I think he'll know more about this, the worker registration scheme. So at some point that was introduced so that workers coming over here, I think it might have been introduced in 2004 mm -hmm. for Eastern European migrants, and so they had to register. Actually, that was a really good source of data for researchers because that was much more accurate. And I think it had to be renewed, but I think because of the bureaucracy that involved, that that was that was withdrawn or it wasn't considered necessary. Um, but I think actually a problem with all of this, the mess around the statistics, is it does make the public much more sceptical because mm. they say, you know, we haven't got control over the numbers because we don't know <coughs> how, how many there are. Um, so, and it does make um, things like planning of services problematic. I completely agree with what Charles said about a, a lot of the, a lot of what's said about pressure on services um, is actually perception and not, not, not reality. But nevertheless, some areas of the country have seen an increase in population. And if those statistics were properly collected, um, then local authorities and um, you know could could plan services accordingly. How many illegal immigrants are there in this country? And when you say, I don't know, everybody says you're a hopeless Home Secretary. I mean, they probably thought that anyway in any case. Uh, but the reason why you don't know is that you don't know. By definition, the people have come, and you, you, you just don't know how many there are. And there's all kinds of speculations that go on. And the reason for that is the, all the numbers that Heather gave are utterly dwarfed by the number of people coming in as tourists or uh, visas looking for work or whatever, where instead of the hundreds of thousands that Heather's describing, you're talking about many millions. And so what happens to somebody who comes to this country as a tourist and then just stays here? And do we know what's happened to them? Now, there was a process to try and count them out, as it were, on that basis. But that, required, that ran into massive issues on the, uh, the, the technology at the borders because of the enormous bureaucracy involved in the whole process. Um, and I can't remember exactly where that, uh, that program stands at the moment, but there is a general view that we should be able to do that, in which case the data becomes clearer and easier to collect in the future. But the reason why I don't know what the number of illegal migrants in the country is is because nobody knows what that situation is, and various research projects are done to try and find out and make an, an estimate, but they, they're subject to all the problems in those areas. Now, the other problem then arises from the first question about the wonderful Amber Rudd. Uh, there's a, a massive interesting contradiction in all this. If you poll people and ask them whether you think we should give refugee to pe give uh, asylum to, to people who are fleeing torture or tyranny or whatever it is, People think we should. If you poll people and say, should we allow people to come and study in this country, people in quite a big majority think we should. If you poll people and say, do you think we should, uh, if people are doing useful work in the food processing industry, uh, that they should be allowed to come into this country, they say we should. Uh, and despite all the public opinion things that are there, the particulars, people understand the basic things that take place. Now, if you take the awful decision taken today, the so-called uh, relating to Alf Dubbs and his campaigning for uh, ch uh, kinder transport and children transport now, I'm sure when, when the polling comes out on this, 
people will say, yes, we should give uh, refuge to children in these kinds of positions. And of course, if you compare this country in terms of refuge giving uh, to people fleeing from Syria or wherever it may be, we give far less uh, refuge to people coming I mean, you just did the finger gesture at the front, but you're quite right. It's, I say far less, but it's really a lot, lot, lot less than Germany, for example, or other European countries. Uh, if you talk to Germany and go to Germany and see what they're doing, they've had a massive programme to try and enable all their communities throughout the country in Germany to uh, give support to people in those circumstances. Sweden, the same. Uh, and it, really a big deal. But unfortunately, we've got into a mindset here and the reason that's the answer to the Amber Rudd question, of saying, actually, the only test is stopping people coming in, uh, despite what people generally think. Now, it, uh, and the argument for that stopping people coming in is the fears that people, I emphasise genuinely, not horrible people or people who are doing it from a wrong basis, are saying in those circumstances. And that's why my answer is to try and get to a situation where we have a system that people understand what's going on is controlled. And I think we have to do that on the basis of a proper system. But actually, uh, th there are people who say the country's too small. We can't take anybody else. Um, I'm very sceptical about those types of arguments, generally speaking, both as an economist and as a politician. I think the argument that says government hasn't properly moved fast enough to deal with the areas of pressure on public services that result from migration. Uh, that's an argument we have to take seriously and hold our hands up if that's the case, because it is our obligation to make sure that we are providing proper public services to all people. Um, but fundamentally, I think the idea that Britain is closed behind a wall is one that I find very distasteful. You're quite right to be concerned about undercutting uh, of wages, and there obviously are unscrupulous employers in, in, in you know, across sectors um, who who have exploited uh, migrants and and UK workers. And you know what 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 we obviously need there is an enforcement system um, to to prevent that happening. Um, in in terms of people, you know, migrant buying. I, 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 I'm not sure that 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 is is correct. If you know, if migrants are are living here and and buying produce here, I'm not really sure how they how they um, how they're not contributing to the local economy. They have to um, pay, pay rent. They have to buy food, um, and actually they pay taxes. And so, um, research that's been done at the London School of Economics has uh, has, has found that migrants put in 30 percent more in taxes than they take out. And the reason for that, I mentioned in in the slides about the age profile of the migrant population it is young and so um, you know they tend to be much more much healthier than the UK population the longer they stay the, the more they become like Brits they become unhealthy they make demands on services they go to hospitals you know they have kids that go to schools but the short-term migrants the ones that you're concerned about are almost certainly putting a lot more in in taxes uh, than, 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 than they're taking out um, and you know, I, I think I think you're right to be concerned about low pay, poor working conditions. Um, but they those things have to be addressed. They're not really a, a result of, of migrants. They're, those kind of practices have been in those sectors for many many years and predate uh, the the increase in in migration. Workplaces aren't. Uh regulated as much as they need to be. Abuses have been let go in a variety of different ways. There are lots of examples of that in sometimes tragic circumstances. And as I said in what I said, people trafficking is also playing straight into some of those areas in a very, very nasty way. So I don't dispute the story you tell at all, but I do say the way to deal with that is to have proper, properly regulated working environments for everybody. And the kinds of examples you're describing, avoiding the minimum wage, for example, uh, can be solved by properly regulating environments. I am worried about the stability in the European Union, not fundamentally, because I think it will remain and will be solid. And I don't think other countries will leave the European Union. I don't, for example, think Marine Le Pen will win the election in, uh, in France. Um, but uh, it is very uncertain uh, what is going to happen. And of course, we have delivered, the UK has delivered, the single most destabilising uh, blow to the EU that could possibly have been imagined. And so um, I know you weren't asking the, making your point from that, this point of view, but there are people in politics who say, well, we'll leave the EU and then it becomes more unstable. And who'd want to be with the EU in those circumstances? Actually, we should have stayed in the EU 
and in my opinion, actually, we still should stay in the EU, and that uh, to help build the stability. Now, what has been the main failing of the EU, in my opinion? It's been fantastic in terms of um, peaceful relations across the European continent since it existed. Uh, it's been fantastic in spreading democracy across the continent, uh, both in southern Europe, Greece, Spain and Portugal originally, and then in eastern and central Europe. It hasn't, I don't think, been so brilliant on the economic side, and I think there's some weaknesses in the Eurozone model. In particular, my own view is that Greece shouldn't have been permitted to be in the Eurozone uh, in the first place. Um, and I think there are some weaknesses in the Schengen Zone uh, concepts. But fundamentally, it's the political failure of the last, I would say, five, maybe more, ten years of the EU that it hasn't really looked at the challenges facing the continent and said, we're really ready to tackle this. The nearest to doing it has been in climate change, where I think the EU has quite a reasonable record of contributing to the global agreements, the Paris process, and so on, and could say it is making a contribution to solving the problems facing the continent. Uh, quite how it will respond to uh, Mr. D. Trump, we shall see. Uh, but on some of these other questions, I think the Eurozone was not run in the right way in some of the issues that uh, that arose. I think the refugee crisis hasn't been dealt correctly. I think the common foreign policy and the way we've dealt with Russia and the issues in Ukraine, we haven't been clear enough. We haven't been strong enough about how we responded to the Arab Spring in North Africa and trying to develop better relations. So I do think there's been a failure of um, the EU in the last recent years, which has, uh, which has uh, accelerated the problem. And my answer to that question is to get it together and to do well in those areas. Uh, Angela Merkel is the leader in the European Union in, who, in whom I have the most confidence, uh, but she's made some mistaken decisions, in my opinion, as well. Uh, and I think there's a real lack of political leadership in the EU at this point, which is what does give rise to me worrying about the stability that you ask about in the question. You have to make a judgment as to whether you have confidence in the comp competence of uh, the current government in this country, and in particular the three Brexiteers, in their capacity to address these issues. I've said publicly I don't. I think, I mean, to be fair to Theresa May, um, I think she's got an enormous tough problem by any standards. It's very, very difficult. But I don't see it coming through. My own view is I, I, I thought there was a 10% chance after we left the... Uh, uh, after the referendum, we wouldn't leave the EU. By Christmas, I thought there was a 25% chance we wouldn't leave the EU because I think it's so difficult. There are so many problems in the process. The negotiations are going to be so difficult. Uh, I think the idea of going to a so-called World Trade Organization situation is nightmarish, and I don't think it's clear that there, there is a path, but it's very, very uncertain. We can't say what it will be. Do I believe that your relative in Madrid will be left high and dry? Um, I don't really believe that. I think it is likely that there will be some kind of agreement dealing with the people living in, uh, in, in b both sides uh, that will operate. What the access to the health system will be is a big, I mean, it's a big question. I mean, I don't know what you think about that, but it's, uh, I think it's a big question. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, the situation of, of Brits uh, living abroad is very different to the situation of EU citizens living here. And the reason for that is, you know, as both Charles and I have said, that, you, that the, the main motivation for EU migrants coming here is for work. They're quite young. Um, you know, they don't really access um, health care and, and, and social security benefits. So agreements on any agreement that was against uh, them in, in that respect wouldn't really impact them that much. Really what they want is the right to continue um, to, to work here. Uh, Brits abroad, it, it, it is very different in that they're a much old, older group and also a more highly skilled group as well. So those who have skills um, who are working in those countries are likely then to come under the non-EU um, migration systems of those countries and possibly then have access to health care. may not be such an issue for them because they may have private health care in any case. I think the three biggest countries are Spain, with a lot of retirees, um, France, Ireland, there's already agreement. So although there's a lot of Brits living in Ireland, I don't see the situation for them changing, changing an awful lot. Um, I suspect then, as, uh, as Charles said, some kind of agreement will be worked um, out between those countries. But I would anticipate, if, if I was a, a Brit living in Spain, I'd be wanting to get my own private health insurance uh, before the premiums uh, rocket.
There's been quite a strong tradition within Europe of youth mobility. And, and I do think that one of the possibilities that I didn't mention is that we will have some kind of policies which keep hold of that. Because uh, whether or not, obviously, you know, despite the fact that the UK has left the EU, I think there would still be interest in, in, youth, in youth mobility. And, and I still actually think that there will be a movement of, of skilled, highly skilled, qualified um, migrants. So any, any, um, any deal that's done between member, different member states is likely to include provision for graduates and um, people with qualifications. So actually, I don't really think ultimately they will be the group uh, that, that, that loses out. I think the UK will have to, if we want to continue being part of Erasmus and those kind of schemes, we can, but I think it comes at a big cost. Um, you know, the same with access to, to European funding. If we want to be part of that, we're going to have to pay much more in, into the pot. Um, I think they are issues, and I share your concerns, but I think some, uh, that there'll be some measures um, to ensure that that kind of mobility does take place. It's the other kind of mobility that I think is much, much more problematic, uh, or more the kind of low-skilled low um, end of things, the, the less qualified, uh, the older people rather than younger people. But I do think whatever agreements are made, it will be worse than now, i.e. Uh, there will be frictions and difficulties and problems in this. But the aspiration that Heather just articulated, I agree, will continue to be there and will operate. I also uh, just go back to what I said in my remarks earlier, that I don't think one should forget the overall economic force behind this, that whatever the situation, people will want for example, trained language teachers or whatever, in other countries in whatever way. And I think that will continue to be the case. But the whole point of the EU was to make these things easy and straightforward without a lot of bureaucracy and red tape and all the rest of it. And uh, actually, uh, that situation, I think, will be more difficult. I take the point you made about uh, top-up insurance. I, can, I, I entirely get that. Uh, but the fact is the uh, people will respond differently to, to the situation as we see it. I'm, uh, I mean, I do think, for example, there will be some kind of health agreement that people travelling to Europe will still be able to use, uh, to, to, to the continental Europe will still be able to use the health systems. But what will be the nature of this agreement? Uh, and what worries me is the state of mind, which is the wall, uh, that says, actually, we just don't want anything across this kind of barrier. And I think that won't actually be the case, but it'll make all the agreements more difficult to reach. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, that's the employers that I've spoken to, uh, most of them would say their preference is for, would be for free movement to continue. So we asked that before the referendum and after, what kind of immigration system you want to get free movement, even after when it seemed that we weren't going to have it. Um, they and they actually, some of them still thought it would continue. I think as you speak to employers now, they're kind of realising that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, so when you say that employers were saying that they, they wanted leave, um, I mean, that's certainly, I think we did ask employers actually, just after the referendum, about what did you think of the campaign? And they felt that their views were not well represented. Um, not necessarily that um, the, the media were covering more of the kind of leave, um, the employers who wanted leave rather than remain, but they felt that the campaign was very dominated by big names, Dyson and Weatherspoons and so on, um, the kind of big figures like GDP and so on, and, um, and not really enough about the actual implications for employment and for employees. And there's a certain amount of regret among employers as well after the referendum that they hadn't involved themselves more in the discussions and um, campaign, hadn't put out messages to their employees, even though they felt that that would have been kind of risky because um, politically they didn't really want to kind of get themselves out there. But nonetheless, um, they felt some regret that they hadn't been involved. And I think part of that is they actually didn't think that the vote was going to go that way. Many employers are very loath to get involved in the political uh, arena. They feel they'll get their head shot off in different ways. And as, as you say, people like Dyson and uh, Weatherspoons, that's not the case. But lots of employers are quite loath to get involved. And that happened in the Scottish referendum campaign as well. As far as associate membership is concerned, it would depend entirely what it was. Um, it's not, uh, I mean, the nearest to that would be the Norwegian type model of staying in the single market. And when I used to be at Council of Ministers meetings in Brussels, you'd go through the whole business of the agenda and then right at the end, 
uh, Norway Liechtenstein would uh, say, have you got any points? And they'd chip in on it. It was a pretty uh, insignificant aspect of the meeting. Uh, but it depends what associate membership is. I, I, I suspect that as we get further down the line, people will start saying more and more that the associate membership type options don't really meet what people are worried about. <laughs>